Evening everyone out there joining us for tonight, the last lecture for the lecture series for this year. And welcome to all members, supporters and friends who are joined, have joined us. I'm Caroline Johnston. I'm on the National Council of the Australiana Fund, Chair of the Events and Marketing Committee and Chair of the Victorian Committee. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the peoples of the Boon and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm Zooming this evening. I'd also like to pay respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. We're in for some really lovely treasures tonight. Yes, a house of treasures, the David Roche Foundation House Museum. A new private house museum for Australia opened its doors to the public in June 2016, containing the life work of passionate Adelaide collector and international dog, dog judge and exhibitor, David Roche, AM, 1930 to 2013. This talk will explore his home, Fermoy House, and its interiors, which can be adeptly described as a compressed version of an English country home. Now, it's our great pleasure to welcome Robert Reason tonight. He's a member of the Australiana Fund, which is uh, terrific. He's worked in the Australian art museum sector for over 25 years. And in 2015, Robert joined the David Roche Foundation as senior curator to assist with establishing a new art museum in North Adelaide and became its museum director in 2019. Robert, it's terrific to have you joining us tonight. I'm going to hand over to you to present and we look forward to it. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Carolyn. And it's lovely to join the Australiana Fund this evening and to, to be able to give this talk on the David Roche Foundation. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge as well that the museum stands on the land of the Ghana people and I pay my respect to elders past, present uh, and emerging. Um, tonight I'll give you really just a, a quick run through of um, the collection and the house and a few of our exhibitions that we've had over the years. Uh, and then at the end, um, yes, very happy to to answer any questions that, that people might have. Uh, I knew David um, for about the last 10 years of his life when I was at the Art Gallery of South Australia. I had the opportunity to work with, uh, with David and Christopher Menz to develop the first book uh, and exhibition of highlights uh, from David's collection. And through that process, uh, I already knew Martin Cook, and I know many of you will, will know Martin, uh, who was one of the, um, I guess, founding trustee directors um, of the David Roche Foundation, which was established in 1999. Uh, then he became uh, the first curator of the collection and the first director um, of the collection as well. So uh, he holds a, a very special place uh, in many of our hearts. Um, I will share the screen with you uh, now. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, so David Roche uh, lived in Fermoy House, which is based in North Adelaide. Uh, the house itself, as you can see there, is a sort of a late... Um, Victorian or early Federation home built in uh, 1897 uh, and he bought the property from the the second owners the Bevan uh, sisters who were involved uh, in in music really from uh, from their father and then through their lifetime as well uh, he bought the house when he was 24 years old uh, the family lived in North Adelaide so it kind of made made sense for him to, to buy the home and also came with quite a large parcel of land, which uh, he used for his dog kennels, which we'll, we'll see more of shortly. Uh, you can see, too, that he, in, in a much later date, um, changed the front front veranda of the home, uh, changing it to the slightly more classical look rather than the traditional um, wrought iron um, veranda and veranda posts. Um, and then the back, uh, of the house you can see here, uh, put in a swimming pool in the mid-1970s and indeed did a lot of work to the house in the 1970s and uh, also built the the folly that you can see at the end of the garden there, loosely based on um, some of the architecture designed by the, the German architect Karl Schinkel. 
and really the garden was an extension of David's collection, as you can see there, lots of sculpture, um, marble urns, uh, and so on. So a very beautiful um, back garden. Unfortunately, the back garden no longer survives, um, mainly due to the fact that we couldn't keep a swimming pool uh, if we were a, a public facility. You know, we had to basically fill the pool in and make it two millimetres deep. Um, and so sadly, the pool came to an end at that point in time in uh, about 2015. Um, here we've got a few images really uh, of David and uh, Martin as well. We can see them here at Portobello Market. Um, so David started collecting uh, in, a, in a small way in, as a teenager, um, acquiring sort of Staffordshire wear uh, and buying from local auction houses. And, you know, it's, it's probably fair to say that when he met Martin uh, in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, Martin was one of the guiding forces of the collection for, for David. And through him, um, introduced him to people like Carlton Hobbs as well, uh, based in London and then later in New York, who was a, a main dealer. Um, that David used also. But, you know, he's happy to buy from, you know, from all the top end shops that have sadly no longer, um, you know, so Phillips and Mallet and, and all of those kinds of um, Jeremy's uh, all in London. Uh, spent a lot of time traveling throughout his life uh, and particularly purchasing through auction houses in Europe uh, and America as well. And the two things really came together in terms of travel with, with the dogs, which we'll, we'll see in a moment. Um, I show the image there of David at the Mario Kratz Museum because uh, if any of you have been to that museum, it's, it's sort of a, a delightful little you know museum tucked away. Um, but it was very important for David when he saw the when he saw the the uh, house museum, there was a lot in it that had things. Um, similar to David's taste with the Italian Grand Tour uh, and, um, you know, French Empire and an interest in Napoleon and so on. Uh, and when David saw that collection and he saw how it was opened by small guided tours, um, he really felt that that was something that he could achieve uh, in Adelaide with his own collection. As I mentioned, the foundation was established in 1999 uh, and really up until his death in 2013, that was a, a period where he tried um, very hard to upgrade the collection uh, and to uh, acquire items that would then uh, hold the foundation in good stead for, for having a wonderful European decorative arts collection. And part of it goes back to um, the Mario Prats there in, in 2001. Uh, also, he, of course, he travelled to Russia a bit uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and in some of these trips, obviously, Martin would be with David uh, and they would be often, especially in Russia, they'd be meeting curators and directors, going to, to palaces and museums. And it was really just to get your eye in, to, to see what was there, what, um, you know, what the collecting interests had been um, of the royal uh, family. Uh, in Russia, and then he started to acquire Russian items, but of course through the the markets based in um, London uh, and New York, and that was something that he was very interested in doing uh, in the late nineteen nineties and and early two thousands. Um, David uh, always said, if you could judge a good dog, you could judge a good work of art. Um, and that was, you know, a comment that he stood by, uh, and really the two things go hand in hand throughout his life. Um, when he started to collect things, he was also starting to show dogs um, as well uh, in his late teenage years, um, and he became a, a best in show or breed judge uh, in his early 20s and was soon judging internationally at all of the best shows, you know, Morris and Essex, uh, in America, um, where he met the Dodge family. Uh, he judged at Crufts in the UK. He was the, the first person um, outside of the UK to ever judge at Crufts. Uh, and the public facing and the public persona 
really for those that knew David, 90% of the time was actually through the dog world uh, and the art and antiques were relatively private. And you had to have a particular interest in that area to sort of get an entree into that part of David's life. And uh, certainly later in life, he was quite hesitant about, um, you know, people he didn't know terribly well coming into uh, his home. But you can see there the Kerry Blue Terriers, which were really his favourite dog um, throughout his life. Uh, he also um, showed Afghan hounds and smooth coat fox terriers. Um, and uh, the wonderful car there, the Jaguar, um, was from a trip when he went to uh, the UK in the early 60s. Um, he bought the Jag. Um, he was traveling with two friends from Adelaide. Uh, and then they took the Jag around Europe with them for a couple of months. And at the end of that, he brought the car back to uh, Australia. Sadly, it's not part of the collection. Mentioned Afghan hounds. And um, David really revolutionized the breed uh, in Australia by bringing in some top um, breeding uh, animals from other parts of the world uh, and then created these, you know, stunning, uh, exotic uh, looking, wonderful Afghans that he exhibited all around Australia and did incredibly well. And so he was, you know, not only judging, but exhibiting for, oh gosh, probably 70 odd years. And by the end of that stage was Australia's most single um, awarded uh show or exhibitor of dogs so incredibly uh, well known uh, within that field and just an interesting image there of Kay Finch who also made little ceramic um, dogs and other small works of art that are very very collectible and um, she gave a number of those over the years to David um, as gifts and Kay uh, introduced him to the Royal Kennels in, in London uh, and so on so he got to meet some very fascinating people um, through the dog world as well. So it's a little bit of a background in terms uh, of, of David, um, his, his history, the house, uh, and the dog world. Um, but here we have um, the start of looking at the David Roche Foundation. Um, so as you can see, uh, we've got David's original home on the left there and where the new museum sits, which has three large um, exhibition galleries. Uh, that was where the kennels used to be. So it was a large plot of land which uh, appealed to David in the first place. Uh, and he had kennels there from the 50s right through until he passed away in 2013. Um, we worked with Williams Burton Leopardi, um, a local architect, um, to create uh, the extension, which is a, a sort of a paired back simplified sort of neoclassic form. Um, you'd all be very familiar with, with the look of it uh, and the fronts of many of our um, 19th century art galleries here uh, in Australia and overseas. And, uh, you know, we've been developing the, the gardens uh, around the, the museum as well. And it is worth mentioning that David was very interested in gardens. Uh, and often when he was in the UK visiting stately homes, it would also be about looking at the gardens. Uh, and here in Adelaide, he always had a full-time gardener. And lots of potted plants and flowers were rotated through the home as well. So, um, you know, it was quite a floral experience uh, in all sorts of ways when uh, visiting David's house. Um, here we have David uh, posing for the BRW um, magazine uh, in the Roman room. And uh, each room was sort of given um, a name uh, and he often collected things with a, a, a place in mind, with a room in mind. Uh, and there's a couple of images there of uh, the Roman room looking the, the other way. So you can see all the curtains drawn. If those curtains were open, you would be able to see that swimming pool that I showed you. Uh, and then the bottom image there is the Roman room today, which we use it as a sort of a sculpture gallery, really. We've brought some of David's sculptures in from, from being in the garden originally. Uh, and we now use this room to hold um, lectures when they're in-house uh, and to welcome our guests when they come in for a tour. So we're open Tuesday to Saturday. We do three tours a day of David's home. Uh, and then we have an exhibition gallery, which I showed you before, which is open to the public 
um, between 10 and 4. So we try to make it as flexible as possible to visit, um, but we do follow David's wishes, and that was that he wanted, um, you know, he wanted a, an experience which was an experience that he enjoyed, which was going to people's homes, uh, enjoying their collections, getting up and personal with things, um, hearing about the owners, hearing about the works, um, and uh, and coming away with with having had a good a good experience, and as he said, a favourite piece to uh, remember. Um, as you enter the home, obviously we've got the hallway there. Um, but when David entered the home, it was always through the the side um, the side door, uh, and you'd be met with this wonderful selection of um, walking canes, crops, and parasols. Um, he used to use some of the simpler um, uh, walking canes, uh, but they're sort of like a little microcosm. Um, of David's collecting interests uh, in that you can see his interest in uh, materiality. Uh, you can see his interest in the skill of the maker. Uh, and you can see his interest in, in function um, as well. Uh, so they're always a nice way to introduce the collection when, when people come in to, to visit the home. <clears throat> um, the way that the house operates now is that uh, you know we take these guided tours through, and you you tour through uh, each room and and learn about uh, a few things in each room. The collection uh, numbers about three and a half thousand items. Um, as I mentioned, there he was always buying, selling, and upgrading. So what you're looking at today is not everything that he ever acquired. Um, he was always happy to sell if he found something better. Uh, and indeed, sometimes he was happy to sell if he just fell out of love with something and found something else that he needed or wanted. Uh, and he needed to free up some funds to uh, acquire that new work of art. Um, so, you know, the, the collection was always uh, evolving and changing. Things were always moving around. Um, and we try to get that idea of it being a, a living, breathing space uh, when we take our tours. And indeed, we can still add to the collection, uh, and uh, and we do. So, you know, we can take things in through gifts, acquisitions, the cultural gifts program, uh, and so on, where they're appropriate to, to David's collection. I guess, unlike many museums, we probably have about 80% of our collection on display. Uh, and the largest portion of the collection which we rotate through is really the ceramic collection, uh, which numbers over a thousand pieces, and it's certainly the largest part of, of David's collection. Uh, but what we're looking at here is the, the first of the rooms, um, named the Russian Room, and um, this is really a room that has taken shape to David's wishes um, after he passed away. Uh, so the wallpaper that you're looking at there uh, and the carpet uh, he had had made uh, and they were sitting in storage um, waiting to go into that room after he passed away. Um, and it was to become a, a sort of a centerpiece for his Russian collection, which numbers uh, around about a hundred about a hundred odd items. Um, and not all of them, but but many of them are, are held in this room. Uh, you can see a wonderful pair of Andre Voronikin designed um, pair of chairs uh, and a German secretary for the Russian market, um, probably made uh, in Munich. And you can see um, the corresponding chair that David saw when he went to visit um, Pavlos Palace in St. Petersburg. Uh, and again, it was this type of uh, information gathering from his annual travels, which uh, fed into his his collecting passions, and likewise, sometimes he'd buy something, and then and then he would think, well, I've got to go to visit that place, um, so that I could put that new work in context as well. So it did work both ways. I think this is a really telling uh, image because um, on the left here we have Pavlos Palace, um, and the room that inspired uh, David's room. Um, he worked closely with the curator and director of Pavlos Palace to. Um, uh, achieve the wallpaper in terms of getting the colour and the pattern and the and the design correct. 
uh, and then you can see the types of objects um, in the two rooms uh, are very similar. David was already collecting uh, in the 1980s and 1990s lots of um, French empire, and he had a little bit of Russian empire, uh, but of course when he went to Russia in the 1990s, he saw uh, the amazing collections that um, the Romanov family had put together, um, a lot of it coming from France uh, and from other parts of Europe. Uh, but of course, then there was also the distinct um, Russian empire as well, which he was interested in too, and which come together in, in the collection here. Uh, and on the other side here, you can obviously uh, see an image of Catherine the Great uh, and a really wonderful Swedish um, documented um, secretary um, by Noah Sorman for the Russian market. Um, it's one of those wonderful pieces of furniture too, where it has little hidden levers, and then the the center uh, of the internals of the uh, secretary pops out, and uh, also other little sections um, reveal hidden drawers as well, which is is quite quite fun but quite challenging. So we we don't often um, use those mechanisms, but it was really through looking at Catherine the Great and her incredible collecting interests and collecting passions that uh, inspired um, David to to go down the the Russian art market and of course it was important to have a an image of Catherine the Great and this is very much a, a typical kind of um, kind of propaganda or court court um, you know image of her um, in her regalia uh, in a very formal pose. Um, represented as the as the Empress um, of Russia. Uh, on the secretary itself, you see a range of malachite. We have quite a large um, collection of malachite uh, items, uh, malachite coming from the Ural Mountains, um, and of course it was also found uh, here in South Australia. Um, but David acquired a number of pieces of malachite, and one of the driving passions for that goes back to this wonderful malachite box uh, that his da his father bought when he was in London uh, in the 1950s from Asprey, and uh, it was a, a cigar box or cigar humidor, so it still has the, the wooden panel uh, inserts inside it. And uh, it was an object that that David, you know, sort of loved as a as a as a sort of 20 year old. Uh, he did smoke at that time as well. And uh, he was always very hopeful that one day it would form part of his collection. Uh, and uh, eventually it did. And it's, it's a really beautiful uh, example of, um, of malachite, uh, uh, you know, decorative functional work of that sort of late, later 19th century. Um, the image here is of David's bedroom. And he, he really started, I think, to to redecorate the house, uh, as I said, in the 1970s. And he worked with a few people at that stage. And he would often seek advice from other designers. But at the end of the day, what you're looking at uh, is David's style um, and David's taste. Um, he didn't let um, you know, people dictate um, what he was going to, you know, to have on the walls or, or whatever. Um, so this is a lovely um, Zoffany paper um, wreath, uh, but it's not to a standard design. So he worked quite closely with them to develop this particular um, take on the wreath uh, in terms of the wreath and the stippling on the background uh, and also the colourway as well. We have a number of different wallpaper samples um, from him working with that. <clears throat> and then he created these wonderful um, curtains inspired again by, um, you know, neoclassical Regency uh, style curtains. So very sumptuous, very beautiful, uh, and add to the the overall kind of setting that David was wanting to achieve. Uh, he also dropped the ceiling in this room to create a more neoclassic ceiling. Uh, and then, you know, every room has a wonderful chandelier in it. Um, this one being... Um, you know, it's still up for debate. Some people say it's French, some people say it's Russian, uh, but uh, lovely quality with the sort of amethyst coloured glass um, dish 
uh, and then this uh, dancing figure uh, above it. Uh, you can also see some of the cabinets or the trains that David um, acquired. These ones um, possibly part of the, the Ickworth um, or Harvey family. Um, he acquired a number of them over the years, acquiring four in the end. Um, and again, they, they just sort of add to the, um, I guess, the a nice continuity of the design that David was after so that nothing looks, um, you know, incongruous or, or out of place. So, you know, historical vitrines for historical works. Um, the bed you can see there uh, is the one that David used. Um, we have a number of beds, so we do rotate them um, through the collection. Uh, and we currently have a, a wonderful um, uh, sleigh bed uh, in that room. Um, but uh, but we, we do swap them around. Uh, and then we have the Sister Parish pair of um, girandoles, which are, again, a, a lovely example of um, early English Regency lighting. Um, owned by Sister Parish, who was the designer at one point um, to the White House. Uh, and, um, you know, these were a gift through the Kennedys for her work. Um, and so, you know, great, great provenance, um, interesting story. Uh, and that appealed to David. Uh, and they also appeared in some of the main books on um, English Regency um, art and furniture, so that added uh, another aspect to them uh, as well. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, a range of um, objects can be seen there, uh, and a particularly wonderful um, chair by George Smith, who was sort of one of the competitors to, to Thomas Hope, uh, and incredibly theatrical, like a lot of painted um, Regency furniture was. Um, the images here show David with um, John and Henry Sandon. Uh, many of you know them through the Antique Roadshow, um, specialists in Worcester porcelain, porcelain and, of course, uh, English um, porcelain in Staffordshire. Um, David brought out a, a number of experts um, later in life uh, after he established the foundation to both look through his collection um, and also to give talks to the public. Uh, and I was you know, lucky enough to attend the, the talks that, that John and Henry gave uh, at the viewing gallery as it was at that stage next to, to David's home. Uh, but they went through his collection and um, Martin was part of that uh, process. And really they looked at uh, all of the, the ceramics in Staffordshire and, and sort of tried to create um, different kind of groupings. So those that were exceptional, um, ones that were good, ones that were okay, ones that really needed upgrading. Uh, and I think probably that's quite a challenging thing for many collectors um, to face. And you know, David found that a difficult process as well. Um, but uh, he did take some of that advice on board uh, and other things he kept because he said, well, you know, I don't really care if it's not a good piece. It's something that's special to me. Um, it has a special memory um, of a place or a time. And, uh, you know, therefore it, it, it fits into a house museum uh, collection in a way that perhaps things might not uh, if it was a, a, a traditional art gallery. Uh, and on the other side there, of course, we have um, our wonderful table, and you can see it in David's bedroom there as well, and it's still there today. Um, it's a fantastic top um, uh, made out of micro mosaic um, by Clementi Chuli um, of a Bacchanalian figure. Um, so the centre is all glass, uh, and then it has this Greek key border uh, in different stones, um, very much part of that um, grand tour uh, experience for people to buy these types of things and, and then take them back to their home countries. Although I have to say often they were much, much smaller than this. It could be a snuff box um, or a small um, inkwell or, or something of that um, scale. So this is a, an incredibly uh, generous and uh, important work being on this type of scale. And then it has a superb base. Um, designed by Percier and Fontaine um, with these wonderful carved and gilded swans. Um, Percier and Fontaine did a lot of work for Napoleon 
uh, and his wife Josephine. And of course, they did a lot of work out at Malmaison as well. Uh, and a lot of the furniture, which is still there today, has the, the swan motif uh, in it, um, you know, either painted white or, or in silver. And so there's a good chance that, you know, this piece of furniture was made, um, you know, possibly for some, you know, type of residence related for uh, Napoleon or, you know, the, or the close circle of, uh, but, you know, it's one of those things we'd love to know more about um, its provenance, which, you know, hopefully one of these days will become uh, apparent. Uh, this is just a few images of some of the things you can see uh, in the bedroom. Um, so the Fabergé that he acquired over the years um, is in one of those vitrines, lovely parasol handle, uh, which came from the Queen of Romania. So part of the kit sort of went through the Danish royal family uh, and then went through to uh, the Queen of Romania and it was sold um, I think back in the 1970s, and then David acquired it much more recently, um, you know, with this lovely Bowenite handle uh, and then the the pink enamel um, and the engine turned uh, metal. So it gives you that lovely pattern through the enamel, um, different colored golds and, and chip diamonds. Uh, and of course, originally it would have, um, rather than having that base that it's sitting in, which is new, uh, you'd have had your parasol um, at the end of it. You could screw that onto it. Um, one of the great things that David did manage to acquire was this uh, hand seal that belonged to um, Tsar Alexander I. You can see the amethyst matrix there um, with the eagle with the wings outspread. Um, and in the centre is the, the letter A for, for Alexander. Uh, and then you can see the, the ivory um, knob handle there. Um, he acquired this in London uh, and brought it back to Australia. Um, and for those of you that have been to Hermitage, um, if you go to the, I think it's the Gold and Silver Vault, uh, that's where you will find um, some of the other uh, hand seals that still exist from, um, you know, from various emperors and empresses um, of the Russian family. But uh, it's an incredible treasure to, to have in our collection. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to, to have it here. Uh, the Derzeg Pistol. Uh, David had a gun license, um, and uh, this pistol he, he he never shot, um, but it was uh, something that fascinated him both in terms of the fact that it does function um, as a as a little pocket pistol, uh, and it's it's a great work of art. It's you know it's, it's a lovely thing made by Durs Egg, um, trained in Switzerland uh, and then worked in London, um, supplied a lot of the. Um, arms, small decorative arms um, to the royal family and aristocracy. And uh, here we have this lovely um, three barrel um, flintlock pistol um, with the with the gold and um, blued steel. And on one side has um, the, the name of the person that commissioned it, who was Colonel Thomas Thornton. And on the other side, it uh, has an image representing the Battle of um, Marengo, which was one of the battles that uh, Napoleon uh, won. So this was um, once uh, a pair of dueling pistols, and they were gifted um, from Colonel Thornton um, to Napoleon, and they were formally recognised um, as a gift. And Thornton, you know, wrote his own biography and included um, the pistol in that that biography uh, as well. Um, and we've been very fortunate that just um, in the last couple of years, we've been able to acquire this John Russell pastel um, of Colonel Thornton from when he was a little bit younger. So the pistol was um, gifted in, I think, about 1802, 1803. Um, but here we have him as a younger man in 1785, uh, looking very dapper um, with his hunting falcon. And uh, as most aristocracy were at that point in time, very interested in, in obviously, in hunting, um, shooting, uh, and generally, you know, debauchery and, um, you know, working in the armed forces and, and so on and travelling. Uh, so, you know, he sort of fitted the bill in many respects. He was um, a well-known figure in his day, um, you know, a handsome man about town and uh, part of the army. Uh, and he was, of course, very interested in many things French. 
and was particularly taken by the the early wins that Napoleon had, and that's why he wanted to uh, to meet Napoleon and to um, give him uh, such a gift. So, you know, we do acquire um, works um, for the collection where we can bring these, you know, these wonderful images of the owner back together with with the pistol there. So it was a nice, very nice thing to do. Uh, very fortunate. Um, as you go through the house, there are many clocks uh, as well. Um, Martin Cook was very interested in clocks, and so was David Roche. Um, so there are well over 30 clocks in the collection. Um, the Joseph Cotto, which is still a, a part skeleton clock. It's not a, what you'd term a normal skeleton clock, um, dating from 1796. Uh, Cotto was a, a fantastic jeweler and enameler. Um, and so really the, the quality of the enamel and metalwork is, is really superb. Uh, and it's a lovely example from, you know, from the 1790s period uh, where you still are managing to get these incredible luxury objects being made, even though, um, you know, the Bourbon family um, had fallen and there was a lot of internal, um, you know, politicking and unrest and civil unrest, uh, but here we have someone like Cotto still creating these superb works, uh, and there's a very similar one that still exists uh, in the Napoleon Foundation, uh, and if any of you saw the, the big exhibition on Napoleon that came to the NGV a few years ago, uh, you'd have seen the Cotto clock um, that was part of that show, and there are quite a few of these clocks around, it was quite a popular model. Um, so it shows the phases of the moon at the top. Then you've got the central dial. Um, you've got a dial uh, further down, which shows the seasons as well. Um, so a handsome thing. And David had first seen this clock uh, in America. Um, it had been um, part of a display of um, clocks and private collections um, at the Frick Museum. And uh, eventually later in life, he was able to um, acquire it from the Dalva brothers uh, and it resided uh, in his bedroom. The other one is um, Italian, um, the King of Rome clock. Uh, again, very handsome piece with a little drum clock on the top and the snake um, points to the, the time. Uh, and then you've got a, a classical um, illusions with the nurture of Jupiter um, below. And also the date um, reflects the, uh, or re references the fact that Napoleon had had a son in that year um, who became or was one of his many titles was the King of Rome. So it could well be um, related to the birth of Napoleon's son also, um, which was something that interested Dave. Um, just to finish the, the clock theme, um, this is, I guess, maybe one of the, the best clocks that we have in the collection in the centre there. Um, by uh, the movement by Moine um, and uh, the, the metal work attributed to um, Pierre Tomer, who is one of the fantastic metal um, metal smiths working uh, in France and, and working for you know Louis the Sixteenth, then working throughout the Napoleonic period and and past it, uh, and it was a clock. Um, commissioned by the Duke of um, Cumberland, who was later the King of Hanover. And it was obviously a, a clock that was uh, particularly special to the Duke because um, it was it was made, uh, uh, you know, well before he became the King of Hanover and he took it with him. Uh, so it then resided uh, in, uh, in his various places in, uh, in Hanover and it was eventually sold when the interior contents um, of uh, Marienburg were sold. It was um, part of that that sale. Uh, so great item. There are a few of these around. Um, so it was a, again, you can find them uh, in other royal collections. Um, and I think one was up for auction last year or the year before. Uh, it's got the nickname of the gossip clock because of the the women spending time talking across the top of it. And then you've also got allusions to time through these dancing figures. Uh, it has a link to, to Russia as well, uh, in that there are various porcelain uh, examples without the clock that exist in Russia today, as you can see. And um, the design for this clock um, is held at the Hermitage. And I was lucky enough uh, in 2019 to ask to see the design, um, because at that 
point in time, none of us knew whether the design was for the clock that David had or whether it was the design for the porcelain um, versions that you see in Russia. So it was, you know, fascinating and very exciting to see the fact that uh, the Hermitage actually does have the design that relates to uh, to David's clock and the the other couple of clocks out there that are in the in the same pattern um, as this one. Um, we move into the den, um, which is sort of set up as a, a sort of an Englishman's um, study. Uh, his Staffordshire collection uh, in this wonderful big um, bookcase, uh, which again is English Regency, which he acquired in the Adelaide Hills, and it just fitted perfectly. Uh, and then we have a range of um, hunting images, so Maud Earl's um, pointer at sunset. We have quite a few um, of Maud Earl's work in the collection. And we also, you know, she came from a, a, a distinguished family of painters, so we also have her father's work, George Earl, and uh, you know she was a savvy, a savvy businesswoman of her day. She had to be because it was still a male-dominated world um, within the art world of being a painter. So if she got accepted into an exhibition, um, often she would exhibit it as Earl, uh, and then she would add her name Maud after the uh, work had been accepted. Uh, other things she did, she would license um, some of these images to um, Scottish whiskey companies. Uh, and she also decided in the end that uh, she would move to America where the um, it was a bigger market uh, and there weren't the same constraints uh, around women artists as well uh, in the early 1900s. So she had a very successful career uh, in America as well as in the UK. Um, so a fascinating woman. And we have, oh, must be close to half a dozen works by, by Maud Earl. Uh, also, um, under the uh, image of the, the Maud Earl pointer at sunset, um, we have these wonderful Thomas Chippendale, uh, the younger Harwood House peer uh, of pole screens. Uh, and, you know, uh, coming from the Harwood House, uh, and of course, you know, that was such a important residence for um, for Chippendale, both the elder and the younger, uh, an incredible range of furniture was made uh, for that home uh, and great to have that sort of provenance to um, Harwood House. So they're lovely objects. And also people um, really enjoy uh, talking about them and, and looking at them when they come through for a house tour because they don't uh, understand what they're for, you know, that, that you would... Um, take them out from the hearth when the fire was lit. You could slide that screen up and down and it would um, effectively stop the direct heat of the fire from, um, you know, from blemishing your face. If you're a woman, from, you know, making your face go pink. If you're a man, um, you know, making your moustache wax, wax melt um, or whatever it might be. So they had a function um, when they were in use and, of course, a, a decorative function when they were sitting uh, in the fireplace when the fireplace wasn't lit. Um, so a lot of people enjoy seeing uh, seeing that as well. Uh, the yellow drawing room, uh, which is really the most formal um, room uh, of the home. You know, none of these rooms are particularly big, uh, but they are, are really absolutely crammed full of objects. And that's why I said it's a bit like a compressed version uh, of a country home. <laughs> So uh, you get all the same things, but um, in a much uh, tightened circumstances in terms of the um, the architectural space that they're contained in. Uh, but this room has um, uh, a silk um, wall fabric that dates from the 1970s, as I mentioned, the first sort of run of making the house look more glamorous and making it um, in a taste and style that, that David enjoyed from, from traveling overseas. Uh, and then the curtains are a bit more recent, so early 2000s, these very sumptuous uh, silk curtains. Um, he also had a carpet made um, to fit this room, which you can see, which is loosely based on, you know, French um, 18th century carpets. He had the ceiling painted in this room as well. Uh, and um, and then a range of, you know, range of furniture and, and items within it. Um, as you can see with the main image, um, we have these wonderful pair of chairs known um, as the Hercules arm chairs. 
probably part of a set of at least six, but there could have been more um, and attributed to the Italian architect um, Quiringi. Um, there were two architects, well, several, several architects, but two Italian architects that worked for Catherine the Great in Russia. Uh, and Quiringi was was one of the one of the significant architects, and so these sort of date from the late period of um, uh, of of that uh, reign of, of Catherine. And you can see if you can look at them carefully, you can see the Club of Hercules, the sort of gnarled club, um, is the the legs of the chair. So quite unusual. And then you've got references to the Russian eagle in the ends of the arm rests. Uh, as well. So when David lived in the home, he would use most of the furniture. Uh, but these chairs, um, you know, even David felt were, were pretty special. So they didn't really get satin. Um, but certainly many of the other chairs were were used. Um, and similarly, you know, when you look at that um, chest of drawers there, um, the Duke of Wellington um, French commode, you know, was used by David. So often when he was buying something, it needed to be functional. It needed to have drawers. It needed to have storage space um, as well as suit the space and, and be an elegant piece of furniture. Uh, you could see the work on the left, the Imperial Glass Factory um, uh, vase on pedestal in the image just shown, um, a really handsome uh, piece, uh, quite large uh, as well, and comes in multiple sections. But lovely to have that what they call waterfall base um, still part of the the vase, uh, and you know very much a a neoclassic design, classical references. And um, when it arrived, you know David was sort of terrified whether it would you know arrive in one piece. And um, when they unpacked it, it was in a crate that was full of sawdust. Um, so that's how they had uh, had transported it um, over to Australia from um, from the UK. And uh, it's certainly one of those items that we still don't like to move very much, uh, even today. It's a bit terrifying to, to touch, so we try to leave it in one location. Uh, the other item is uh, a wonderful um, lacquered commode um, attributed to um, Pierre Foulet. Um, it's in a sort of a uh, a late um, Bombay shape, um, so you know still Rococo, but not um, overtly Bombay in form. Uh, but has the most wonderful Rococo um, uh, gilt metal or ormolu mounts, which are really sumptuous uh, and in beautiful condition. Uh, and then it has what looks like Chinese lacquer, um, but of course the the French had managed to to really imitate um, both Chinese uh, and um, Japanese lacquer quite successfully um, from the 1750s onwards. Uh, and so we, we see that um, in this piece of furniture, you know, very technically very good uh, example of, of French lacquer from the 1770s. And then has this lovely Brestelette marble um, top as well, which was quite a popular um, marble in the in the 1770s um, period uh, in France. Um, paintings that um, will often reside also um, in that yellow drawing room, uh, the Robert Lefebvre uh, of Desiree Clary, um, later the Queen of Sweden um, in this lovely neoclassic uh, muslin dress, uh, and then slightly earlier, uh, Francis Coates, very well-respected uh, English portrait painter, um, pastelist, uh, and uh, oils uh, of Mrs. George Rogers. Uh, and she was quite interesting in that she was part of the Tyres family, which were part owners of the Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens in London. And uh, here she is illustrated um, with a very sumptuous jug, uh, watering an exotic Indian lily, um, referencing her passion for, you know, for botanicals, um, and her knowledge of uh, plants and gardens, and very much within the the sort of style uh, of Britain in that period, and in situating a, a what looks like a fairly formal portrait um, outside in nature, um, so bringing the the two elements um, together in the in the works from this period. 
Uh, some of the items you'll find uh, in the yellow drawing in these wonderful um, Italian vitrines, uh, obviously a, an amazing array of porcelain. Um, so, you know, obviously the Meissen, uh, I've got a lot of Meissen in the collection, including the Prince Orloff service, um, a lot of Worcester porcelain, um, this one, the, the Duke of Gloucester service, uh, and not so much, but this wonderful piece from um, Ludwigsburg porcelain factory of a tray, which was part of a larger set. Um, there were two made uh, and one was gifted um, from the Furtenberg family who were related to uh, Russian royalty, um, so gifted um, through to um, Paul I and Maria Fedorovna, um, the, the then owners of Pavlos Palace. Um, and more recently, the rest of that set was gifted um, back to Pavlos Palace. Uh, but, uh, you know, here it is showing part of the, the royal family um, outside of Russia, um, the Württemberg family, and just, you know, reconnecting those those blood ties between the two um, the two families. Uh, Chinoiserie bedroom, uh, you know, we do know that many of these rooms went through different transformations. This was once um, had a pink wallpaper in it. Um, the wallpaper is a de Gournay paper, um, a lovely watered silk curtain. Um, these sort of date uh, from around 2004. Um, as does the the bedspread um, on this lovely uh, double bed, Italian double bed after the sort of design style of um, Giuseppe Bonzanigo, <clears throat> um, with these sort of burning finials at one end, uh, and then these gilded tied um, artichoke hearts uh, at the other end. And above it, <clears throat> you know, David didn't, he was quite, in some ways quite clever about what he collected. He collected things that were relatively sturdy. So he didn't really collect photography. He didn't really collect much works on paper. Um, textiles, yes, he did collect some. Um, but again, he was sort of was well aware of the longevity of what he was purchasing. Um, and certainly the tapestry is the only one uh, in the collection like it. Uh, but it's from the workshop of John Vanderbank. This is something that we found out um, after David passed away. Um, and it's a grotesque tapestry from 1700 to 25. Um, Vanderbank had come over when um, when the, the, the Dutch sort of royal family um, came over with um, William, William of Orange. Um, and he wanted to establish... Um, tapestry workshops in England and, you know, decorate places like Hampton Court and so on. Uh, so Vanderbank was in quite uh, strong demand for not terribly long, but, you know, sort of around a 20, 30 year uh, period. This is obviously a, a smaller, what's left of a much larger tapestry um, and believed to have been made um, for, for Irish um, aristocracy. Uh, so it's quite, quite a well documented piece and, um, possibly one of um, a set that were made looking at the senses. So this one possibly um, the, the sense of, of um, smell, the little monkey uh, on one corner smelling a, um, a, a, a um, I think it's a peach off memory, but, um, but yes, yeah, so this is quite a lovely um, example of its type. Uh, military dining room. Uh, so again, you know, as I said, the rooms are quite strongly themed by David. Um, this one has a, a red flock wallpaper again from the 70s. Uh, and he was purchasing military portraits through uh, throughout his life and upgrading as he went along. Uh, the main image, I'm sorry about the, the reflection, um, is again another Robert Lefebvre, um, you know, really talented um, French portrait artist uh, of Anatole Demidov as a young boy. Um, Anatole again was a. It came from a Russian family, uh, but spent most of his life living in France uh, and Italy, and would become a, a great collector himself um, of all types of things, including um, lots of malachite and other interesting stone that was used in his um, villa uh, in Italy. So this painting sort of has pride of place, 
uh, in in David's military dining room. And um, you can see there as well uh, a wonderful, on the right-hand side, a wonderful George Bullock side cabinet. We have uh, a really lovely collection of um, English Regency furniture. Um, you know, I mentioned George Smith, Thomas Hope, uh, George Bullock. Um, so we have a number of pieces by George Bullock, including the, the light um, or chandelier that you can just see uh, in the central image as well. And uh, again, you know, as an aside, and I, I don't know whether it was something of interest to David or not, um, but Bullock was the person that designed all of the furniture that went uh, in the last residence that Napoleon was held captive in, in um, when he was on the island of, of Helena. So there is a, a link back to, uh, to his interest in Napoleon as well through uh, Bullock's furniture. And in that room, you can see a range of Grand Tour um, items as well more French Empire, uh, and a range of porcelain that relates to, um, you know, to the table because it's a, it's a dining room. Uh, so, a, you know, a range of, you know, dessert pieces, chirins, um, you know, tea, tea, coffee, so on, uh, are all held within the, the dining room. Uh, we move through to the kitchen, so we're nearly there. Uh, kitchen was quite a, a different space for David. Um, you know, we've removed the, the modern fridge, but um, other than that, it's really illustrating how David um, used the kitchen. So it was another space to exhibit his collection. Uh, not terribly keen on cooking. Um, you know, go down the road or have something brought in. Um, so, you know, the kitchen cupboards are pretty old and daggy. Uh, but, you know, every space on the wall has, has something um, covering it. And it was a fun area for David because he, you know, he was quite upfront and said buying expensive things when he did was, was um, you know, was exhausting and worrying, uh, whereas buying something, you know, from a car boot sale or an antique shop that you just popped into um, was much more fun, much more enjoyable. It didn't cost you too much money. Uh, and you had this wonderful thing, and he used that idea to create collections of things. So you've got all of the lusterware jugs in this room. Uh, you've got lots of different um, plates that relate to, to, you know, the nursery or learning the ABC or, or whatever it might be, uh, through to, um, you know, different mugs, money boxes, um, chook chureens, and so on. So... You know, it was an enjoyable room for, for David, and uh, I'll just show you a couple of things um, from the room. So you've got the butcher's, um, butcher's shop uh, diorama here, uh, which is all hand-painted um, and carved and then sort of placed into this frame. Um, you do see them around. Um, and then we've got interesting things like the um, the, the Ponty Pool wear, but this one with a really interesting provenance. Um, to um, to Slade's campaign teapot, uh, through to things that David, you know, really treasured um, but weren't terribly valuable. Um, so this lovely little string box um, from around 1800, which, uh, you know, stood the test of time, uh, and David really enjoyed having it in his collection. Uh, he also collected some items that um, are European but obviously reference Australia. Um, so the part zoological coffee and tea service with the the kangaroo uh, and another service, part of a dessert service with the, um, you have to look carefully, uh, but you can see the kangaroos there uh, at the Jardin de Plant uh, in Paris uh, around the same time that um, Malmaison also, you know, had swans and kangaroos and, and lots of Australian um, plants and flowers and so on. Uh, we're moving through to the atrium in the new wing here um, with some of David's sculpture. Again, the large um, gilded works, the Apollo, Antonis and Mercury were all in the garden originally. Um, the Robert Adam, after Robert Adam, Fawley House urn was kept in Sydney, always had a house uh, in Sydney and, and the family had always had links to to Sydney. Even as a, as a child, he would quite often go to Sydney in the school holidays. Um, he did some of his schooling here in Adelaide and then um, then he went to Geelong Grammar. Uh, and then, you know, I didn't really mention it, but he joined the family firm for a short time, uh, which was the Adelaide Development Company. Uh, and he retained, uh, you know, a significant share in that company throughout his life. 
uh, and it was really through the Adelaide Development Company that he was able to to follow those great passions uh, in life um, through through the dog world and the collecting the antiques as well. So it uh, it really enabled him to put together uh, an astonishing collection, which he then, you know, when he passed away, very very generously donated the collection, uh, his home, uh, and basically his his estate. Uh, in trust to run the house uh, as a private house museum, which is um, what we've been doing since um, mid-2016. Um, so I'll just move on very briefly because I know we're out of time. This just shows you the, the new exhibition space. Um, we used it initially to show uh, David's collection, uh, and then we shifted to having temporary exhibitions. The first one was this one, uh, Edo Star, which uh, was from the Art Gallery of South Australia. Um, and then since then, we've, we've uh, some of you might know Annette Giro uh, has a fantastic quilt collection. So we showed these in 2020, and we're actually having a, a new exhibition of um, quilts that she's acquired uh, since then, uh, later next year. Uh, we had an exhibition looking at Captain Cook based on this wonderful table that David bought um, by Goodman, the, the resolution table, which was on long-term loan for about 15 years to the National Library in Canberra. Uh, and we brought back the, the table, a number of items from the National Library, and then also a range of contemporary responses um, by First Nations artists. Um, to to look at um, part of those sort of uh, events that were happening around um, Cook and the Pacific voyages. We've also worked with Powerhouse Museum. Uh, I'm sure many of you know um, Eva Cernus Rill. She curated uh, a beautiful exhibition called Fantastical Worlds for us, uh, where half of it was from our collection and half was from the Powerhouse collection. Uh, and uh, just a couple of installation shots um, of it there. This year, we had this lovely show, which I curated, um, of the work of Arthur Boyd, his large tapestries, um, pastels and drawings, which were all uh, loaned very generously from the, the National uh, Gallery of Australia. Uh, and stunning to have um, 12 of these tapestries on display at any one time. It was uh, a real um, highlight for me personally. Uh, and then finally, just to finish with, um, this is our current exhibition, um, Wedgwood Master Potter to the Universe. Uh, the exhibition runs until the end of January, so um, you may have the chance to, to come over and view the exhibition. Uh, it comes with a lovely catalogue as well that we've, um, that we've published. Uh, it's really looking at Wedgwood from the 1760s right through to 2023. Uh, again, well over 20 lenders, both public and private, um, with over 250 works in the in the exhibition uh, and includes, of course, some wonderful pieces by uh, David as well. Uh, and I do want to also acknowledge, of course, that the Australiana Fund uh, itself uh, has some really wonderful Wedgwood uh, in its collection, um, particularly the Australian Flora um, series, uh, which we, we borrowed um, from another collection, um, but certainly we're very aware of the Australiana Fund um, items. Uh, and also, uh, of course, you have one of the, the very famous images of, uh, of Cook as well. So um, it's a nice way to sort of bring this talk um, to a conclusion. And I hope you've enjoyed looking very quickly uh, through David's home uh, and some of the exhibitions that we do. We, we run about three to four exhibitions a year, um, often with a decorative arts uh, focus or some type of link um, to, to David Roche's collection. Uh, and we're, yeah, as I said, incredibly fortunate um, to be in the position that we are to uh, have David's home open to the public uh, and to be able to hold these, these exhibitions. So just wish to thank you. Uh, thank you for um, attending tonight. And um, I'm ready for some questions as well. Thank you. Robert, that was terrific, absolutely terrific. And, and really you've brought that collection to such life. And what a wonderful mix. It must be very special for you to have a mix of the contemporary 
exhibition spaces. You can stop sharing your screen too. Um, the contemporary exhibition spaces, as well as all of that amazing rooms in the ha in the house and the furnishings, and it's just such a rich environment. Uh, mm. And congratulations for you for 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 what you're doing there and having time to curate other exhibitions as well. I, uh, um, if you do have any questions, those that are listening, please drop a few in. We we are a bit out of time, but I think we're happy to go on and, and our participants sit, still seem to be hanging on. Many thanks, Robert. Fabulous talk from Bettina and Richard in, Queens, in Queensland. Just wonderful. Margie Betrys as well saying terrific talk. And it was. You, you just brought it to life. And I think the dedication that David obviously had for putting a collection together and also being feeling like it could be a, a long-standing legacy um, mm. is clearly one. You must have, a, it must be a fascinating place to be. I'm going to start off with a question. We'll just have a couple given the time. Um, how special has it been to you to come in at the beginning of this development and to see it now flourishing and spaces have been built and created? Mm. I mean, you know, it's, it's an incredibly you know, rare opportunity. Uh, so yeah, it was an incredibly uh, exciting to be able to join the foundation um, towards the the end of that build, uh, and to work, you know, obviously with Martin and the trustees to you know to to really work out what we were going to do and develop a website and develop those first uh, hangs and displays and and open it to the public. Um, and you know, as someone that that's very passionate about the decorative arts. Uh, it was a, a also a, a wonderful opportunity to to look at David's collection, and you know we're still discovering things all the time. Um, and you know for the Wedgwood exhibition, it's it's enabled us to spend more time with that part of David's collection and really research it uh, and and find out new things about it. So I think that's also one of the lovely things about the temporary exhibitions where they include David's work um, is that you still get these new new discoveries. Mm, how wonderful! And I'm going to ask you: Do you do? You, I mean, I was blown away by the by the breadth. Do you have a very very favorite piece? <laughs> uh, look, I I don't actually. It, it probably depends what I'm working on uh, <laughs> at the time. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, so or if you know, if you find out something about something, you know, that becomes your your favourite for for a, a bit of time. And in some ways, that reflects David's attitude to collecting as well. Um, when he first bought something, it would sit in his bedroom, and that was his favourite spot. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as he got used to it, or something else came along, it then got shuffled to where it was supposed to be uh, in the rest of the house. <laughs> Taking good opportunity to really love it. Um, Jennifer Sanders, our chair, has asked a question very much when he was assembling the collection, it seemed to be the goal of it being a working collection, and you mentioned that most things could be sat on and used and whatever. Uh, now that, of course, that it's a house museum, um, what's the legacy of this use in the collection now? Do you keep the patina of age and, and use visible in the furniture and furnishings, and what about the dogs? What impact did they have on the collection? Mm -hmm. I mean the 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 dogs were nearly kept separate, um, but he did have some pet dogs that were in the house. Um, Chihuahuas in particular, uh, and BG, a, a German Shepherd, at one point. Um, so you know, David was you know happy to happy to have the wear and tear, and you know he used a lot of things, obviously, to put the plants in as well, the potted plants, and you know we've got one of what would have been a set of, um, you know, cash pose or whatever else. So things did get broken uh, when David was living here. We obviously don't want that to happen, um, but we do want people to still have a very personal um, experience. And I think we do manage to do that because we don't rope and barrier things off. Um, you can come in and, and really get up close and personal to items and like any gallery you know we're very happy um for people to make a time to um to come in if they want to see something in particular if they're you know doing research or or whatever uh and bring those items out for them to handle uh and look at uh and a bit like in david's tradition we do have some local 
um, artisans that David used um, when it came to polishing furniture or cleaning chandeliers. Uh, and so we do continue that legacy as well. That sounds terrific. Uh, here we have another wonderful piece of feedback. My first Australiana lecture says, says um, Chris, fantastic stuff. It's a very high bar that, and have a great night ahead for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, I think probably it's a good time to say again, thank you, Robert. It's uh, it's terrific that, sh that you have been agreeable to having the lecture tonight. You've given us just a wonderful mini tour of the Roach Foundation, Roche, and I encourage everyone that is there to go and have a look. Thank you, Robert. I'm sure if everyone was together, we'd all be clapping away heartily. It's terrific. Uh, thank you to everyone at the Australiana Fund that's put this lecture together. And I must remind people, uh, a wonderful Christmas offer is a uh, book collecting for the nation available at $55, including postage and packing, which is a steal. Um, this lecture and other lectures this will be lecture will be available soon on the website and there are all the other lectures available that you can go to when you have um, some free time and really thank you again Robert it's been a terrific journey with you Pre really appreciate your time and thank you for everyone that came on board we'll be in touch when we know our program for next year and mm -hmm. thank you everyone good night thank you thank you it's been a pleasure